Coming up on today's Airborne, Boa Copter development is progressing. Proudbird gets a one month reprieve. And Xcore Aerospace ULA achieves a major propulsion milestone. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. FAA Administrator Michael Huerta called on the airline industry to work together to assess and prioritize voluntary actions to further improve training across the industry. Tom Patton reports. FAA Administrator Michael Huerta is calling for a joint industry government steering group to assess pilot, flight attendant, and dispatcher training that will build on the FAA's new rules for commercial air carrier pilot training and qualifications. The group will be tasked with evaluating best practices from across the industry, review recommendations from previous FAA rulemaking advisory committees on training issues, and examine newly identified areas of risk. The goals will be the development of voluntary training guidelines for air carriers. Administrator Huerta has asked that he be provided the top five focus areas to improve air carrier training. The new air carrier training steering group, composed of safety experts from the airlines, crew member unions, government, and the aviation community, will consider these recommended focus areas as the first order of business when it convenes. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. The German company Evolo, together with a network of partners, is pressing ahead with the development of the technology for the Volocopter during the next few years. The Volocopter is an electric-powered, multi-rotor, vertical takeoff or landing aircraft. Think of it as being like a quadcopter unmanned serial vehicle on steroids, with the ability to carry a pilot and a passenger. According to the Evolo website, a two-year development phase flight testing program in collaboration with the German Federal Aviation Office and the German Ultralight Aircraft Association is underway. The maiden flight and first test flights were conducted in an arena with the prototype of the two-person VC-200 model on November 17. A production model based on the prototype will be developed in the coming years, the company says. With the multiple flights lasting several minutes, nearly reaching the 70-foot high ceiling of the arena, the Volocopter concept is reported to have exceeded all expectations. Last month, we reported that the Proud Bird restaurant, a fixture for decades at Los Angeles International Airport, was due to close its doors after failing to come to terms with airport managers for a lease. Well, that may change due to what was described as an outpouring of support for the restaurant and its owner and founder, John Talashe. The business has been given a reprieve until December 31st, while Talashe negotiates with the leaseholder Los Angeles World Airports. Los Angeles World Airports and City Hall had told Talashe that his rent and minimum wages for employees must be increased due to federal laws. However, consultants have said that there are some ways to get around the laws, such as granting an easement to the museum area where the restaurant's iconic static display of historic airplanes is located. The parking lot could also be rented out by the city on an as-needed basis for additional terminal parking. We hope the Proud Bird can pull this off and continue its legacy at LAX. Xcore Aerospace and United Launch Alliance, known as ULA, have announced a significant milestone. They've completed first successful hot fire of the subscale 2,500 pound thrust XR5H25 engine in the Xcore and ULA liquid hydrogen engine development program. Conceived as a lower cost, risk managed approach, the goal of this engine program is to produce and operate a subscale demonstration engine. This demonstrator will enable a future decision to pursue development of a flight ready cryogenic upper stage engine in the 25,000 pound thrust class. The larger thrust engine should cost significantly less to produce and be much easier to operate than competing upper stage rocket engine technologies. Fifteen years ago, November 20th, 1998, was a day to mark in history. The Russian space agency, now known as Roscosmos, launched a proton rocket that lifted the pressurized module Zarya, or Sunrise, into space. 
Zarya was the first piece of the International Space Station. It would provide a nucleus of orientation control, communications, and electrical power while the station waited for its other elements. Two weeks later, on December 4, 1998, NASA's Space Shuttle Endeavour launched Unity, the first U.S. piece of the complex. The two space modules, built on opposite sides of the planet, were about to be joined together in space, making the space station truly international. The space station represents a collaboration between NASA, Roscosmos, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency, representing 15 countries in all. The first crew to inhabit the space station launched on a Soyuz spacecraft on October 31, 2000. It consisted of one NASA astronaut, Commander Bill Shepard, and two Russian cosmonauts. Their arrival on board the station marked the start of a permanent human presence in space. And speaking of the International Space Station, we now have a story that tells us just how civilized space life has become in the last 15 years. The six crew members aboard the International Space Station will enjoy a Thanksgiving dinner while floating in orbit 260 miles above the Earth. Their menu will include traditional holiday favorites with a space food flair, such as a radiated smoked turkey, thermostabilized yams, and freeze-dried green beans. The crew's meal also will feature NASA's cornbread dressing, homestyle potatoes, cranberries, cherry blueberry cobbler, and the best view from any Thanksgiving table. NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins and Rick Mastraccio will celebrate the American holiday with their one Japanese and three Russian Expedition 38 colleagues. NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn and Vicky Colaris, the agency's manager of the International Space Station food system, will discuss the space station's Thanksgiving menus and live satellite interviews from 0700 to 0830 Eastern Time, Wednesday, November 27th. The new owner of Monmouth Executive Airport in eastern New Jersey is Wall Aviation, LLC. Richard A. Asper, chairman of Florida-based Aviation Professionals Group, a consulting company, was hired to help close the deal. Asper said the changes at the airport will happen immediately. He said that, quote, this airport is going to join the 21st century. This is an airport that deserves to be first class, end quote. But some of the airport's current tenants, such as Jersey Shore skydiving or banner towing operations, may not be compatible with the new owner's vision for the airport. Asper said, quote, It's very difficult to convince the pilot of a $30 million airplane to land here. We've got to look out for people falling out of the sky, end quote. Asper said that the banner towing planes, which operates out of the airport over the nearby Jersey Shore, are businesses that the new owner likes, but may not be compatible. He said they will eventually be ebbed out and relocated to other airports in the area. The story of the Tuskegee Airmen is one of trial and triumph. Now another member of this historic group of aviators has gone west. Lieutenant Colonel John J. Suggs passed away in October at the age of 98. Suggs had flown 70 combat missions as a pilot for the iconic unit during World War II and had continued his Air Force career through the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Suggs retired from the Air Force in 1968. His decorations included seven Air Medals and the Air Force Commendation Medal. Suggs passed away October 10th at the Knollwood Military Retirement Residence in Washington, D.C. You're watching Airborne. More in a moment. Redbird Skyport is a multifaceted aviation laboratory charged with developing innovative solutions to the issues facing the industry. It started out as a vision for a laboratory where we could objectively measure the systems and the processes that we were developing. Being able
able to put some objective measures behind the anecdotal evidence that we have about the value of motion and the application of this technology is very, very important because until we can objectively measure it and play that data back, we can't design training systems that make the best use of it. For more information about Redbird Flight Simulations, as well as Redbird's new Skyport, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com or www.redbirdskyport.com. Rebuilding the sport aviation world one aviator at a time. That's ANN's new Aerosports ebook series, your resource guide to the ultimate in aviation adventures. Aerosport will feature the straight skinny on learning and enjoying 16 unique aviation sports, from ultralights and ballooning to aerobatics, gyroplanes and hang gliders to parachuting, home builds and general aviation to RC models. All this and more will be coming soon with the new updatable Aerosport guide for your favorite electronic devices. Get your advance order in now at www aero-sport.net Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-by at aero-news.net An aircraft operator had his M-squared Breeze 2 float plane confiscated by the Monroe County, Florida Sheriff's Office. After he buzzed a group of boaters at an altitude of about 25 feet, on September 14th. He then landed and offered the boaters rides for three $20 bills. As it turns out, neither the aircraft operator nor the aircraft held any level of FAA certification. It's reported that he might have gotten away with it, but he was observed by a vacationing FAA inspector who made a report to the FAA Aviation Security Office in Miami. The Monroe County Sheriff's Office confiscated the plane and charged 46-year-old John Walsh with possessing an unregistered aircraft and operating it in a careless manner. Other charges are pending. And now it's time for our Aero Video of the Week. This week's video will give you an idea of what it's like to occupy the bombardier seat during takeoff on the commemorative Air Force's B-29 Fifi. It's the best seat in the house. Search Fifi Takeoff in Madison on YouTube. A newly elected member of the Seattle City Council, who is a self-described socialist, has told Boeing's machinists that they should take over the factories if Boeing moves production of its 777X airplane out of the Puget Sound region. The councilwoman is Kashama Sawant. She campaigned as the socialist alternative and is reportedly a former Occupy Seattle organizer. At a rally in the city's Westlake Park, Sawant said the workers, quote, should take over factories and shut down Boeing's profit-making machine, end quote accusing the company of economic terrorism for looking outside the Seattle area for a place to manufacture its newest airliner. She said if Boeing tries to move the work elsewhere, workers should take over the manufacturing facility in Everett, something she referred to as democratic ownership. She said once the workers have control of the factories, they could be retooled to start building things everyone can use, like transit buses, instead of, quote, you know, war machines, end quote. You gotta love free speech. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. And please keep in mind, there will be no Airborne this Friday as the ANN crew recovers from our respective turkey comas. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.